I think we slowed him down at any rate, and we made him work pretty hard. I feel that I walked out, walked out to that C-141 in Hanoi with my, uh, with my head held high, and I felt about 10 feet tall. So we brought our honor, honor home with us, a little scarred, but we brought it home. AAA hit the aircraft, the aircraft started to roll and descend, and I got out somewhere under 350 feet. That was the longest day of my life, the day that I got shut down. Every move they made from the day I arrived in there was designed to get something out of me or to get something against the United States. It was war in that camp, just as if it were war down on the battlefront. Every single day, every minute of the day. North Vietnamese told us when we were their prisoners that when we came home we, we would be immediately thrown in the jail, that uh, the average American citizen thought that we were in fact criminals. They were very much against us. Of course, we didn't believe this. 
but we didn't know to what degree the lie was made. And it was but as far to the other side as possible because the reaction that we've received since, we've come, uh, since we have returned home has just been fantastic. Sir. Okay, okay. Uh, how are you, huh? Boy, I'm great. You're all just wonderful. You're just wonderful. You really are. Although I'm not a very religious man, I shut my eyes and said about 30 seconds of silent prayer. And I, uh, I felt, as I've never felt before in my life, quite obviously, the realization that it really is true. We are here, and we can't go back. And we're here. And uh, at that time, I probably, in those instances, I probably became a better American than I've ever been. Well, we're really see receiving the things that uh, I think would be more appropriately due to the guys that are, will always be over there, uh, that are buried in the, the dirt and the mud of North Vietnam and the jungles of South Vietnam also. We're a symbol of the people that were lost. We happen to be regained. We always knew that you would not forget us, that you would not leave us in that foreign land. And our thoughts were always of our God, our families, and the honor, the honor of America. God bless America and its wonderful people. Thank you. It was in 1967 that I was sent by the Defense Department to do some documentary paintings about the Air Force people at work in Southeast Asia then. I just got the message from the other pilots that if I was painting their story sincerely, I should include in my efforts some kind of documenting of the men in the prisons up in the north. I knew that there was isolation. I knew they were holding them in incommunicado. I knew our men, and I knew that they would, under the most severe circumstances, try to be strong. But I visualized it would be dark and lonely and, and, and terribly bleak. I remember especially uh, Colonel Flynn's comment when he said, yes, he says, yes, they're very good but they're not harsh enough. And then he said something to the effect that our story is not just coming off the plane and going to the barber shop. You have to know something of our six years there. And he said, can you paint torture? They went through an incredible amount of pressure, both casual pressure from just being in prison camp, but more particularly from organized physical and psychological abuse. And usually alone. Well, I found a a closeness to God that I had never found before. And a couple of times when I really needed him, I came booming through. Faith in God was probably the, the, the cornerstone of my uh, resistance. I was able to, to stand firm when I thought that uh, the end looked like it was in sight and uh, uh, all was lost. Colonel Day told me about the, uh, his upper arm that was broken for a period and then paralyzed after uh, being constricted and told me that the arm was about the size of a bone plus maybe a blood vessel or two and I had evaded uh, as I say uh, 32 patrols and unfortunately was uh, shot and captured by an ambush patrol on the uh, uh, my 13th day out he was in solitary for 37 months or something like that and uh, he said that they just look at his arm and his hand and try and get him to move and eventually he thought he could see him move and then he knew he could see him move and that gave him enough uh, to look forward to so he just kept working at it and it's amazing. It was easier to go through each month than it was to go through each day. Yeah, I mean he used to watch bee legs hatch. That takes about 11 days. But they had a big push to get the American POW to write these statements condemning the war in hopes that internationally it would embarrass the United States. Of course, each of these was a carbon copy of the one before, and every one that I know of was extracted by means of torture. In my capacity as a debriefer, I have uh, spoken to 
half of the returnees that have come to this hospital. One of the most important things we have learned is how vital communication was for their daily existence. Within a camp, they used uh, some very ingenious methods of communicating. Uh, primarily, they would learn to uh, talk through walls. And by talking through walls, we're talking about walls that may be 18 inches to two feet thick. We'd pass poetry through the wall, learn poems. Uh, if you're fortunate enough to live by somebody who knew a foreign language well, they would instruct you and you could study a foreign language. They utilize their sense of humor, which sounds sort of macabre to talk about a sense of humor when you're getting the hell beat out of you. But they were able to utilize their sense of humor to resist this in a very real way. Then, of course, as soon as they got together, they were able to band back together and gain support from their, their common, uh, uh, against their common enemy. By staying organized and uniting against the V, we forced them to give us medical attention. Even though it wasn't much, it was more than we would have got before. It was a, it was a lot of hours of, of pure boredom. And there were a few moments of stark terror, too. Captain Brazelton was called to quiz, which was their uh, jargon for interrogation. And uh, during the process of the conversation with his interrogator, uh, he asked Captain Brazelton a question. Uh, Captain Brazelton gave him the answer, and uh, the interrogator got a, a puzzled look on his face for a moment, and then he leaned across the table and putting his elbow on the table and summoning up uh, all of his uh, knowledge of American idioms, he stared into Captal Captain Brazelton's eyes and said, Honest engine? Chewing on a piece of grass, walking down the road. How long you gonna stay here, Joe? Some people say this town don't look good in snow. You don't care, I know. Venture a highway. None of them seemed to have any bitterness about what they'd been through, and that really impressed me. And they were also warm and open. Colonel Lurie came up one day to the nurse's station, very straight-faced, and said, do you know why they give second lieutenants gold bars? And I said, no, sir. And he said, that's to tell you apart from the officers. I'm Colonel George Fong. I'm the homecoming processing team chief. The job entails supervising the processing of our returnees, coordinating of such activities as finance, personnel, uh, the debriefing, and the medical aspects. We're pretty much involved in almost everything that the POWs do. After the first group of returnees came in, I had to be real sure that I had on my uniform when I went downstairs. The thought was that uh, I shouldn't be down in the ward in a pair of black pajamas because the returnees might think I'm a VC. I'm joking, of course. And when it's convenient for us, they bring in the experts, and they're bringing them in apparently from all over the Air Force, and they're taking the time to tell us what we want to know, to give us the answers to our questions. Where do we go from here? Yeah. Yeah, hey, Will, that looks like a pretty good lunch you got there. Oh, brother. Got everything going? Just fine, sir. Uh, every place we go, why, we meet with, uh, with a fine reception. We had a lot of thoughts as to what kind of diet would be required for these gentlemen. And almost without exception, they required nothing in the way of a special diet. They ate as much as they wanted of anything they chose. The only uh, somewhat unique thing about the diet for those of us who were based in the hospital was their apparent relish for the hospital diet, which of course not shared by the rest of us. Wishing on a falling star, waiting for the earth. Train. Sorry, boy, but I've been hit by a purple rain. Oh, come on, Joe. You can always change your name. Thanks a lot, son. Just the same. Venture a highway.
been uh, some surprises, the length of hair, the style of clothes, the material clothes are made of. I really like the mini skirts. I was just afraid that they were going to be out of style before I got, got back. And you know, getting used to mini skirts is a big shock. I think the men's styles are really uh, quite a change. I really like them. The colors, the styles, the flared pants. The double knit trousers especially, I really think they're the most comfortable thing I've ever worn. I just wonder where they've been all my life. I have not heard a single good thing about the United States in six years until I got the clock. Everything you heard was bad. Sig the whole world is watching. Peace now. Here's the bayonet pie with the order about face. Stop the war. And now they've got the Democrats on the way of the face I'm sure that we will all be better men and better officers for the experience that we've had. I knew the day I was captured that I was going to be released. There was no doubt in my mind about that. I knew that we would get out. Most of them, if they weren't reflective when they went over there, have come back reflective and appreciative of a lot of the things that most of us take for granted. I have more of a purpose in life. I think I know more of what I want to do compared to before. Just walking out of the out of the front door and doing a 360 and looking at the clouds and the stars and the grass and that sort of thing is really an experience. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear mine. Happy birthday to you. I had a suspicion something was coming up by the way people were milling around, but I didn't expect this really. I was expecting the bachelors to pull something sneaky. I'm impressed. You all set to leave? All set. Thank you. Thank you very much for everything. We enjoyed having you. Thank you. I sure will. Millie, thank you. Thank you. Good luck, When the first group of uh, returnees left, I really felt like we were losing friends because we really got to know them, especially because they came in at, um, in different groups of small groups. And uh, we really, we got to talk to them a lot more and got to know them, each one of them. And I, I really felt like I was losing a friend as each one left. Right. John? Right. Have fun. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure working with you. Thank you. Same here. Good seeing you again. Yeah. You all set? Okay. See, primarily the last couple of weeks have been uh, sort of a gentle re reintroduction into uh, normal society. But once I climb into my automobile and uh, drive back toward my home, it's going to be a, uh, an opening of a, of a large door, it seems, uh, from a small room. coming into the rolling hills north of High Point. We're interested in uh, specifics of his uh, shoot down so that we can learn the lessons which may improve our equipment or our tactics uh, for the future considerations. We want to know of his treatment. We want to be able to understand the mentality of the people that kept him in captivity. We're interested in things that they may do to their own people. How do they treat their own people? What is life like? You just can't realize the pressure anybody's under when they're MIA. And then eventually, you know, you find out that they are a POW. It just changes. 
your whole outlook on everything. Have you heard about when your husband should be back, when he's expected? I know the last date he'll come home would be the 28th of March. So at least that's not too long. So I don't think there'll be any problem at all about uh, flying again. Yeah, speaking of flying, you know, uh, I got shot down an F-100 up there, F-100, F-100, Weasel Bird. And, you know, for many years, we, uh, we just had made a few jokes about SAC, et cetera, and, uh, wondering when they were going to get into the war. Yeah. And I'll tell you, then finally came December 18th, and we knew SAC was there. The guards initially tried to control uh, the prisoners, but in very short order were so frightened themselves, they were, they were ducking in their manhole covers and uh, under boards, and they didn't see him for the rest of the missions. And after the first evening, uh, they never even came to see what they were doing in, inside their cells during the bombing raids. Well, I'd flown about 160 missions yeah. in a B-52 over there. And then uh, to watch the last yeah. three or four nights uh, from the other end was, was really impressive. Uh, there was a man on my crew uh, that didn't turn up in camp and kept looking for him because he had checked in that he was okay on the airplane. And uh, come to find out, he had been evading the enemy for 12 days before he surrendered to the enemy. Captain Peter P. Camarota. Uh, Captain Peter Camarota was the man's name. He did a good job of evading for 12 days. I'd like, to, I'd like to thank everybody for the warm welcome we've gotten all the way across, and uh, it's great to be back home at March. I'm glad the POWs are back, and I'm just curious to see how they will adjust. But certainly when they get back with their families, it isn't going to be, isn't going to be too hard or take too long to fit in. My wife has done such an outstanding job then that when I got home, actually, it, it was like being gone for months rather than years. There, there has been absolutely no transition problem at all, and I'm very grateful for that. I, I did receive a few pictures in North Vietnam. Uh, if I hadn't, I'd, I'd have probably been scared out of my wits when I came home and actually did see my children. When I left in February of 66, my, my son, my youngest of three, was nine months old. But Basically, there's no change in their personalities. I, I recognize them. My son is, uh, is a new entity to me, but he's accepted me very, very quickly and very easily. Uh, I've gone to this little fellow's schoolroom and, and answered a bunch of very <laughs> surprisingly intelligent questions from what, what grade is he in? Second grade. Second grade. They wanted to know how I like being a prisoner. Mm -hmm. They wanted to know what I ate. Who won the war? They want to know who won the war, which is an interesting question in itself. They wanted to know if it was cold. They wanted to know if it was hot. But they knew what was happening. They were aware, and that was when they were even in first grade. I think probably more aware than some adults. Well, I think that the release of the prisoners of war is uh, one of the greatest things that's happened in this decade. Well, it's really wonderful to have everybody home together again. And I think it's a very good thing for the spirit of the country. We believe that we as a group are not unique. We think that the 575 or 600 people that are involved are representative of the services, uh, representative of all of the people within our services, because after all, uh, we were not hand-picked to be sent over there. We were on the wheel of fortune. And I just, I wish that we could bring them all back, but we can't and we never have from any engagement that we've had. And those are, those are the people that really caught the brunt of the war. And I think those are, those are the people that we owe so much to. The V had told us for so long that the American public wasn't behind us, but yet they were out there hollering, God bless America. We, you could tell that there were the Americans that fought in every war since time began, since we've been a country. And it made you proud again to be an American. Proud that maybe that we did something there, that it wasn't all in vain. There were Americans behind us. And that people like the V 
will never last and never endure with theirs because they rule with fear and that's the only thing they know. They only know force and they only know fear and if they can't rule with that, they don't rule. We don't act like that. Those Americans are free and they're there because they're free men. Those children were hollering and screaming because they wanted to, not because someone was forced them to or someone drove them up there to make them do it. And that's enough to make you proud in those five or six years that we spent up there, or seven or whatever they may be, were worth that. And maybe those children won't have to go fight. I hope so. Colonel Lynn was the first man in blue that I had seen since April of 1966. He represented everything that I stood for, the reason why I had spent so much time in North Vietnam, in that he stood for freedom, the right to say and do what you want. And I was going back to that, watching that 141 that had just come in to pick us up. I think I had a bit of apprehension, not really knowing what to expect, but knowing that there was freedom out there, and the 141 represented my flight 